Hello. Okay. Uh, hi. So I'm sure you're more tired than me, right? So <laughs> we had the morning session too. Um, but let's continue from where we were yesterday. So I was confused, right, uh, at the end of last class. So let me move it up now. Uh, but before that, any question from last time about anything? Or no? OK. Uh, what we were discussing, so we, we, look, we look at entanglement distillation, right? And the idea of entanglement distillation was that we had some states, rho AB. And now imagine that we have many realizations of the same experiment. So we can have many copies of rho AB. And we imagine we have this LOCC paradigm. And I would like to distill this entanglement to a good form, right? Basically, into some number of copies of a maximally entangled state. And we like to get as many copies as possible, right? So the best, if you do the best thing possible here, the best LOCC protocol, we get a given number of copies, right? So the, you know, the number of copies of EPR pairs that we can get per copy of Roy B, that's this function that we call distillable entanglement, right? So that, that, that tells us the usefulness of this for teleportation, right? If you, if you want a phrase like that. And then I claim, oops. Then I claim to you that, um, well, first I said it's very general to compute this in general, right? Um, that's an open question, interesting. If you could come up with a formula in general. But for bipartite pure states, we do have a nice sense, right? Yes. <laughs> it's low. I mean, we can hear you, but for the filming, I guess. Better? Okay. Um, so actually, for bipartite pure states, we can compute it. And it's just for Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix, right? That's what we saw last time. Um, and right, I, I argue that this is a good measure of entanglement for pure states, right? For pure states, entanglement is equivalent to the or to the amount of mixedness of the reduced states, right? Not in general, but for pure states. Um, and then I just gave you, right, start giving a sketch of the argument. So I want to do it now, right? So let's consider the simplest case, and then I'll leave it to you to figure out the general case. It will be similar. Let's just suppose we have a pure state of two qubits, for example. And then we know that by local unitaries, local unitaries on Alice and on Bob, we can put in Schmidt form, right, in the Schmidt decomposition. Uh, but these local unitaries, right, they cannot affect the amount of entanglement. They, we can do them by LCC and undo them by LCC. So let's just assume it's in Schmidt form to begin with. So then it's great there is only two parameters, right? So 1 minus p amplitude, we have the 0, 0 state. 0 on Alice, 0 on Bob. Square root p, we have. 1, 1. And we're interested when you have many copies, right? So we have, right, so, this, well, but by now, we should have introduced, right, but what, what I mean by that is the end fold tensor product, right, of the same state over and over again. Um, great. Now, the task is to find the LCC protocol, which maps this to the largest number of copies, right? So the goal is to map this to R where R is as big as possible, right? Um, but now we, we are going to do that. But for simplifi to simplify the problem a little bit, let's just remember that we had this d-dimensional maximally entangled states. And suppose we just look at the maximally entangled states. We have this notation, right, of some dimension d. What it was, this guy, right? Um, and I claim that this guy, up to a local change of basis, right, which you can always do, so it's the same as 
the max entangled state of two qubits, which is this one, right? The ZPR pair, um, to the power of n, where capital D is two to the n. Okay. So a way to think about this state when this two to the n is just that we have n copies of a two qubit max entangled state, right? So this is up to no. We have to really find the local basis, right? Um, and I leave you to check this, right? It's not easy, it's not hard to check, but you should see that that's the case indeed. So in the distillation problem, we can change it, right? So now, instead of writing this way, we could also just write as we map it to phi d plus, and we want to write, and, and then distillable entanglement of this psi is always bigger, if there is such a protocol, is always bigger than log d over n, right? Is that clear? Question? Can you say that uh, who, sorry? Can you say that again? Same again? Yeah, so um, we have this equivalence, right? So if you have an LCC protocol which maps to this guy, suppose that z equals 2 to the n, right? That's equivalent, or oh, sorry, 2 to the n times r, for example. That's equivalent to the problem we had before, right? So by this equivalence, right? That's the same as mapping to n times r copies of a two qubit state, right? And we know this r, the syllable entanglement, if there is a protocol which achieves that, we know the syllable entanglement is at least r, right? By the definition we had before, right? So, right, that's it, right? Great. So, and now to show you exactly that. I'm going to show you a protocol, LCC protocol, which maps this guy to this guy, where z is roughly n times r, and r is just this thing. Okay? This is the goal. Um, great. Before doing that, let's just figure out what is this in that case. So we have this particular state, right? We have to compute rho a. What is rho a if that's the state? You should know that, so you, you have to tell me. What is the reduced state on A of this two qubit state? Yes, correct, right? Good. And because that's the state, if you compute the entropy of rho A, what do, you, what do we get? We saw last time the formula for the entropy. Yeah, up to, yeah. Right, why? These are the eigenvalues, right? These are orthogonal eigenstates. These are the eigenvalues. That's the entropy function, right? So basically, in that case, we want to show that, you know, this R can be, this is called the binary entropy, right, of this distribution with one minus PNP, right? Um, okay? So this is what we want to do. And what was the idea last time was for Alice to measure basically the Hamming distance of her register, of her n, n registers, right? So let's check it out. So, what's the goal? Come up with a local operations class communication protocol for doing that. The protocol is the following. Alice measures the total sigma z operator. on her n spins, okay? What, what are the, um, what are the eigenvalues of this guy? Uh, well, uh, right, it's one and minus one because I'm not normalized, but indeed, if you would, right? But then you are summing them, right? So basically just integers, right? So, um, 
right? So it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? And minus as well, right? Um, but actually, I want, yeah, that's right. Uh, but then, right, so, but we measured this, but we measured just the total sigma z, right? So, so given that we got value m, for example, right, there are many eigenstates associated to it, right? So the eigenstate would be that you, say you have, uh, so basically this m is measuring how many spins are up. If you get m, we know that n, m spins are up, n minus one are down, but we don't know which ones, right? So you have many of them, right? So uh, given, outcome m there are or how many n choose m right different configurations right with that outcome of configurations um, Another way to say that, so if you know, this is like the physics term, right? In computer science, we would say that Alice measures the Hamming distance, right, of, of her string, right? Um, but now she measures it, and then what is the probability that she measures PM? Uh, let's work it out, right? So first, she's making a measurement on her system, so this would only depend on her state, right? Um, and therefore, right, the her state is, she has n copies of this guy, Right, and now she's just measuring how many ones she has there. Right, so uh, the probability of getting right, so measuring this, the total number of ones that you have on this is just what is this? Well, it's an easy problem. Right? This is a binomial distribution with probabilities one minus p and p. And you want to see what is the probability of measuring m right uh, once in a binomial distribution. Right, um, who knows these probabilities? Probabilities of binomial distribution. One, what is the probability that you get M ones if you sample it? That's really hard, right? But you saw it before too, right? But uh, maybe I just do it. Is N choose M, right? P to the power of M, right? Because that's the probability of getting one, uh, right? The probability of getting one, uh, one, one is P, of getting M one is P. Then you have to get one minus P zeros, Sorry, we have to get n minus m zeros. The probability of getting one zero is one minus p, right? But you have to put by this binomial because the order doesn't matter, right? So that's it, right? So that's the standard thing. Uh, great, so, but, but why are we doing that? We are doing that because it uh, doesn't matter which m we get. Once we get an m, we prepare a maximum entangled state of dimension n choose m, okay? So that's uh, the point, let me erase it. Right, so, so, so think about that. So I, I tried to expand this last time, right, and then I got it wrong. Uh, but we don't even have to expand. Then I will not get it wrong this time. But um, what, what is the idea? The idea is that, right, you expand this, and then the first register with n qubits, Alice has it. The second register with n qubits, Bob has it. But they are perfectly correlated, right? So whatever Alice gets, Bob gets the same, right? So that's of the form of the state. And now Alice just measure uh, and gets you know, hem is M. Then, right, there are N choose M different possible configurations, okay? And now let's, uh, K, right, it's just, this goes from one to, uh, to N, N choose M. That's just labels for all the possible configurations with M elements, okay? With M ones, with M ones. Then there is states, right, after measurements, uh, post measurement states. Will be one over square root n choose m sum uh, over k of kk, right? Um, right, so um, no, the, uh, for, for Alice, all these states with M1s, 
they were in superposition before, we're not discriminating between them, so we keep the superposition, but because this is perfectly correlated with Bob, we have this entanglement, right? So this automatically, because we, are, we are, because we are measuring how many excitations we have, how many ones we have there, but only that, we are not measuring anything else, right? So we're very careful to not measure more properties of the state, we end up in this superposition, which is a maximum entangled state, right? By what I told you before, right? So this is just, remember, we only care about like, we can relabel the base any way we want. This we don't care, right? The local base. So this is uh, the same as phi plus n choose m, right? We're kept to this n choose m, right? Uh, so great, so this works, right? So Alice measures, she gets one m, she communicates this m to Bob, they know, you know, uh, they can just apply some local change of base to map to the computational basis, and they have a maximum entangled state. What they do not have control is the dimension of the maximum entangled state, right? The dimension is n choose m. And now we have to work out what is the value of n choose m, right? And not surprised you'll be, right, the exponent of the entropy times n, but let's see it. Yeah. No, so Alice measures this observable, right? So it's, right, so this observable has some eigen, well, uh, this observable, uh, let's denote PI. These are the projectors of it, right? And the projectors, if it's P1, it has one one, if it's P2, it has two one, and so on. So Alice just gets this outcome, M, right? Just get this number. And we know that the post measurement states is PM, identity applied to the original states, right? Which is, which is that state. Which is exactly this state, yeah. Right? So um, now why they have to know M both? Because they should, you know, this is just labels for this, uh, you know, the states where you have M ones and N minus one zeros, right? They want to map it back just to the first terms of the computational base, for example, right? So, so then they do this rotation, but right, this is, that's why no, uh, there is a communication about M just for them to, to rotate back, but. To, 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 to compare the results. Not to compare, but just to, you know, because think about it, suppose it's, suppose M equals two, just for simplicity, right? Uh, then uh, their states would be, you know, so you have one, blah, blah, zero, blah, 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 zero, right? And the same thing for Bob. Right, this is one term. And then you also have then zero, one, zero. The same thing for, for Bob, right? N terms, right, up to all zeros and one, and all zeros and one, right? Okay, so this is a maximum entangled state of dimension N, right? Uh, but you know, the, in, in this real basis, right? Now they can map it back to just having the first N computational basis, right? So, right, so uh, it's, just to, it's just to have everything back to the computational basis that they do it. But they don't have to if they want. If they're happy to have in this form, it's already done, right? But if Bob doesn't have this information about M, they don't know where the entanglement is, right? So that's uh, the point. Okay, so we want to analyze, right? So we measure M. M has a binomial distribution. That's the distribution of getting a particular M. Given this M, we have a maximum entangled state of dimension n choose m. Now we want to argue, is a binomial distribution, uh, right? So many independent realizations of the same independent random variable uh, and identically distributed random variable. We know this will be very close to the mean, right? Then we'll get what is the typical value of n choose m and then we'll be there. So let's do this final thing. Um, so for n much bigger than one, right? We have this binomial distribution. which has mean, this is the mean of the distribution. What is the mean of a binomial distribution? This, right? What is the variance? Someone says something? Yeah, very good, yeah. Right, so it means that the standard deviation is square root n, right? So good, right, makes sense, right? So it's ID, so the bigger, right, so it gets very concentrated around the mean, right? And then you can even have some tail bound that, you know, the probability actually 
that m minus n times p, which is the mean, right? So it's independent random variable. The probability that is bigger than delta times n, you can show that that's exponentially small in a delta square n over 2, for example. <coughs> okay? So it's tightly concentrated around np, right? So, that, you know, any delta is more than 1 over n, it grows, uh, it grows exponentially, right? So, uh, well, uh, sorry, any, um, yeah, any delta is more than 1 over square root of n, right? It grows exponentially. So what this means, uh, so let's use that, right? So this means very likely we will get m, which is very close to n times p. So we just have to analyze the binomial coefficient of np, uh, so, so, or, sorry, of n choose np, right? n times p. Um, So, you know, very likely, so with high probability, D, which is the dimension of the maximum entangled state, which is N choose M, will be very close to N, uh, sorry, will be very close to N, NP, right? Now we can use styling approximation. I won't do it, but I leave to you to do that as an exercise. If you do it, you see that that's very close to 2 to the power of n times the binary entropy. Okay? This is usually the symbol for the, did I erase it? Yeah, the binary entropy, which, let me write again. This is this. Okay, and we are done, right? That's what we wanted to have, okay? So, so that's the proof. If you go to higher dimensions, it's the same, right? But now instead of just binary variables, you have a higher alphabet. You can do it in the same way, right? So now you have uh, IAD samples from a probability distribution, not like over zero and one, but over zero, one, two, and three, but it doesn't matter. And you, have, you can apply the same kind of idea. You can map now, you now measure the Hamming distance, for example, you say, what is the total number of ones and the total number of twos and the total number of threes and so on, right? You get an expression similar to, right? So now it's a multinomial coefficient. You can use Stalin approximation again and you get the general entropy formula, okay? So that's a harder exercise, but it's worth trying to do it, right? And, oh, by the way, someone asked me for references and I, I will send them online, but because I didn't have time, at least for this part, you can, Check it out here. I want this lecture notes. Well, there are many places, but this is one where it's, it's close to what I said. I'll send more reference by uh, online once I, I collect them. So, okay, so that's all I want to say about entanglement, distillation, pure say entanglement. Now I want to go to other things. Uh, but before that, is that clear? Is that, are there questions here? Okay. Um. Yes. Yes. So we have this guy, right? Uh, which one, this one or in general, the general idea? Yeah, right, so, um, so let, 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 let's consider this case again, right? So this is, suppose you have this guy, right? N copies, and now we measure this total number of ones that we have there, and we get M equals one, for example, right? M equals one. Then how many possible strings you can have on Alice, right? So this is one valid outcome, right? You have M he, uh, one here in the first position, all zero, right? This is another one. You have one in the second position, all zero, and so on, right? But you have a distinguish between this string and this string, right? Because they have the same eigenvalue, right? And initially they were in uniform superposition, right? Because they have the same probability, right? The probability of all of them is the same, right? It's like square root of one minus P 
uh, times, sorry, square root of 1 minus p times n minus 1 times square root of p, right? So now they are in uniform superposition, position, right? But Bob is perfectly correlated with Alice. So he must have the same thing, right? So you just show that you have this state now. But this state is just a maximally entangled state, right? It's the state of this form of dimension n, right? Because you have n terms, right? So up to a change of basis, it has this form. Right? And the same idea works for every m, right? You get the same thing. Yeah, yeah it's a bit, maybe something you have to do yourself, but Good, so let me tell you now um, another, so, so the way I told you what entanglement is, right, is to define this LOCC, local operation in class communication, and then you can say the entanglement is exactly uh, the states which cannot be created by LOCC, right? So that's one way to define them. So let, let me tell you another way in which you can, uh, you know, another way you can understand entanglements. And that's by looking at what is called entanglement monogamy. So what is that? Imagine that you have a, a classical state. For example, just a perfectly correlated state. Of dimension d. What is that? Well, that's a quantum mechanical description, right? Everything is classical. Alice says k, Bob has exactly the same k, and they have uniform distribution over all possible d values for k, right? Um, so, you know, a and b, they are perfectly correlated, right, in this classical way. Uh, but now, um, we say that these correlations, they are shareable, okay? Uh, in the sense that there is a bigger state, A, B1, B, actually I was gonna do this by K, so let me put here another thing, I. We can have, high, okay, I can define a bigger state, which is the following. where A and all the Bs, they have the same I, right? So if A has I, all the Bs have the same I, right? So think about this, maybe this is the correlations of two stocks, right? So if one stock has, a, and suppose it's a perfectly correlated, right? Maybe there's some that we don't know, right? Some cartel that we don't know, and the price are always perfectly correlated of these two, right? But no, the same could be for arbitrary number of stocks, right? Um, in practice it doesn't happen, but nothing forbids that, right? So this will say that these correlations, you know, is, is the maximum correlations allowed by classical mechanics and they can be freely shared. Um, now let's look at quantum states and, and the picture will be very different there. So, um, So let's take an example first before the general statement. Example. Suppose row AB, now there is quantum mechanics and it's just our old maximum entangled state. Okay? And now the question is, there exists, does there exist uh, row, even like two extensions, AB1, AB2, such that row AB1 equals this maximum entangled state and row AB2 equals the same maximum entanglement state. Right? Which is exactly right. We could have this classically, right? Classically, we had exactly that. So now instead of maximum class correlated state, we have a maximum entangled state, and we ask the same question, right? Can we, can the correlate, if A is maximum entangled with B, can it be maximum entangled with B2 as well, right? So that's the question. What do you think? Who, who, someone said yes? Someone said yes, no. 
I guess no, yeah, right. Yeah, from the way I'm phrasing, it seems like the answer should be no, right? Yeah, that's true. Whether there exists this extension, you know, if A can be maximum in B1 and B2 at the same time. Right. Very good. Exactly. Yeah. So, exactly. The answer is no, right? Um, why? So, you know, let's just consider row a, a, B1, and B2, and suppose that's the case, right? So now, the answer will be no. So I'll just use this again, and let's see why not. So suppose we have a tripartite with this reduction, okay? Um, but now, um, what you can show, this is an exercise, it's not too difficult, but it's easy to try to figure out. What you can show is that actually the states must have this form, must be this maximum entangled state here on AB1, and must be products, tensor products with rho B2. Okay? So actually, rho B2 has to be uncorrelated from AB1, right? So they do not have any correlations. Okay, so that's very different from, right, from classical mechanics, right? So classical mechanics, the fact that A is maximally correlated with B1 doesn't tell us anything about the correlations of A with the rest of the world, right? In quantum mechanics, and that's why we call, like, say, entanglement monogamous, the fact that A is maximally entangled with B1 necessarily implies that it cannot be entangled with anything else, okay? And I can say, okay, maybe this is very particular. In a sense, this particular is more about being entangled in a pure state at the same time. But actually, uh, this is a defining feature of entanglement. So let me tell you the general statement. But is that clear? Is there a question? So, um, so the statement, something you can prove, we won't prove, unfortunately, but um, is the following? So, well, actually, no, but before, let me, take, let me make a definition, okay? So the definition is that a quantum state is K extendable, okay? If there exists a big state with many Bs, with K Bs, such that all the reduce, all the marginals of A with Bi equals the original one, okay? For all I. So A is equally correlated with each one of these Bs, right? So the picture is like, and the correlations are all the same here, right? So that's, then there is results. Suppose like this perfectly classic correlated state that rho B is K extendable for all K, then if and only if rho B is separable, is not entangled, right? Okay, so in a sense, the f this fact that entangled in the sense is these correlations, so its correlations doesn't distinguish from classic correlations. What distinguishes is that it's these monogamous correlations, right? So uh, they can be correlated in a way which precludes the system to be, uh, of being correlated with anything else, right? So that's, and that's basically entangled. If the state is entangled, at some point, it cannot be, uh, for some K, it cannot be equally correlated with that many uh, different bobs, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, maybe I'm missing something, but I'm, I'm thinking about the THC state. Yeah. You have three qubits, and each one is pairwise correlated with the other one. All right, so that's a good example. Let's see it. It's because you're thinking about the, uh, the global state, right? So you're saying, let's take this global state, which is does this guy.
we have k right here, and we have right. Um, but now the theorem is not about this global thing being entangled. That's okay. The theorem is about what is the marginal, right? And let's look at the marginals. The marginals they are actually classically correlated, right? So the margins are this. Right? So that's just, you know, this is separable, right? It's like classical, right? So in that sense, right? So um, it will not, uh, we don't care about the entanglement properties of the extension. The extension can be, right? So this guy has a quantum extension. This guy also has a classical one, right? We will just copy, right? The classical label. So the theorem is about this marginal, right? So uh, this marginal has an arbitrary number of extensions. So it has an extension with an arbitrary number of b's, if and only if it's separable, it's not entangled. So, um, um, right. And actually, you can even say more. I, I won't tell you, but show you, but it's quantitative. And there are many quantitative statements. But one that you can make is that if Roy B is K extendable, then there must be a separable state which is nearby by some quantity that depends on K. Then there is a separable state. If you minimize over so all separable states, this distinguishability that we saw before, trace norm, this is always smaller than two times dimension square over k. This is the local dimension, so rho e b is a density matrix on CD by CD. Right? So we also have this. Uh, so, you know, it's not like, okay, it's only true in the limit, but actually if you don't if you want to approximate, you can truncate a finite k, right? So if k is sufficiently bigger than dimension square, local dimension square, it's already very close to separable, right? And then, you know, it's, you can treat it as separable if you want. That's very interesting in computer science, like, or if you want to have numerical tests to test whether something is entangled or not. It doesn't quite do the job, but there are some, some But I, I don't want to uh, touch on that in this class. Um, is the statement clear? OK. Right, so what I want to do in the rest of the class is to give two applications of this monogamy, okay? So that's a very central aspect of entanglement, right? So you can just define entanglement using it if you want. So there ought to be some, right, um, implications of it. And I'll give you two, uh, not like in full detail, but the, the rough idea. The first is just that how the idea of quantum key distribution, right? The fact that we can have this way of establishing secret correlations using quantum mechanics, which is unconditional, unlike classical mechanics where this is impossible, one way to think of that is really due to this property of entangled monogamy. Uh, and then the second, be more physics, uh, which is this recent uh, application in trying to understand properties of black holes and where people found that there is a, some, well, there's many paradoxes associated to it, of course, but people thought that they understood the problem and they saw they didn't understand, which is this firewall prob problem. And that's very much, again, related to this entangled monogamy problem. Okay, so I wanna, to give you a very rough description of what's going on there. Um, yeah, so, okay. So, any, is it all clear? Okay, so let's. So we all know many applications of monogamy, right? It's used to be monogamic. Um, but in quantum mechanics, in particular, one is quantum key distribution. Okay, so what is the idea of quantum key distribution? Imagine that we have Alice, Bob, but now there is someone else. If, if is like a shortcut for if dropper, and you can just think the rest of the universe. You know, there is Alice in some lab, Bob in some quantum lab, and the rest of the universe we can just treat as some adversary, which is trying to malicious learn something about Alice and Bob. And the, and the goal of Alice and Bob is 
um, go establish perfect uh, secret perfect correlated bits. So So how you model this? You model, one way to model this problem is that initially there is some states, psi, A, B, E, that's a state of Alice and Bob, and we just assume that Eve has a purification of the state, which just means that Eve has access to the rest of the universe, right? There is always a purification. We give it to Eve, it's like the worst case, right? And then Alice and Bob, they apply some, well, uh, they map this by LOPC, I'll tell you what this is, into a final state. Let's denote this by, which might be mixed now. And the goal is for these states to be very close to the following, to, in the simplest case at least, to a perfectly correlated state. Let's suppose they just wanted to see one bit. They might want to see more. which is completely unknown to Eve. Okay, so Eve has this marginal, but it's completely uncorrelated from this guy, right? So if they do that, if they can achieve that, Alice and Bob, they, have, they are perfectly correlated, and Eve has no idea about these bits, right? So if Alice has zero, Bob has zero, if Alice has one, Bob has one, and Eve has no idea, right, about them. So this is a secret bit, right? This is a perfect correlated and, and secret bit. What is this class? This is similar to LOCC's local operations, so Alice and Bob, they do whatever they want locally. So they assume, of course, Eve doesn't have access to Bayer Lab, right? So that's a minimal assumption. But now differently, Eve controls everything else, right? So in particular, controls the communication channel between them. So the communication now is public. So Alice can send messages to Bob, but Eve will intercept it, right? And that's the, uh, that's the meaningful assumption here, right? Um, and now, um, and I claim that this is possible in quantum mechanics, okay? At least, um, yeah, at least for like interesting choices in, of A and B, there is a way of them to do that. And I'll tell you how to do that in a rea realistic way, roughly now. But that's very different from classical mechanics, right? For classical mechanics, that's just impossible, right? So um, there is no way without assumptions that you can come up with a protocol where uh, if you give the rest of the universe to Eve, right, uh, you don't know what she has. In particular, because she can always just have a copy, right, of Bob's system, right? Eve can be just, initially, is exactly what Bob knows, Eve knows as well. And there's no way to break the symmetry, right, because the communication is public. So that's why, you know, cryptography, at least, quantum, at least key distribution, classically, is fundamentally impossible, right? And then, how we handle that in, pra in practice, we have to come up with some computational complexity assumptions. And then it works, but they are not unconditional, right? So that's something uh, interesting about quantum mechanics. So why this can work in quantum mechanics? Well, it's just because of entangled monogamy. So so suppose that you know they have the initial states okay and it just turns out sorry this is e and it just turns out that the marginal of a and b is a maximum entangled state okay let's consider this particular case first then what by what we saw before we're done right because this implies by what I told you, by monogamy, that this guy must be equal to a maximum entangled state on AB, on AB, tensor 
a completely independent quantum state on Eve, right? But now to just map to that form, uh, A and B measure in the computational basis, right? And they get these perfect correlations, right? So they get which is completely unknown to if. And then you can use them, right? So once you have this, you can send a secret message. What do you do? Uh, you get a message you want to send. You XOR, at least XOR with this random variable, okay? Uh, sends through a channel, and, you can, and then Alice can decode perfectly. And if Eve intercepts, because it's XOR with a completely random thing, it looks completely garbage to Eve, right? So she has no idea. So once you have secret key, you can send secret messages as well. So this is clear, right? So what is the core here? The core is just, just knowing that Alice and Bob, just knowing that they have a maximum entangled states, they are automatically decoupled from Eve, right, by monogamy. And therefore, right, maximum entangled state is two things. It's a pure state. This makes it uncoupled from Eve, but it's also perfectly correlated, right? And therefore, they can have the secrets, right? Um, of course, the, uh, this doesn't really be a problem completely yet because usually they will not have this, right? But that's how entanglement distillation comes in, right? So uh, what is one approach, at least, to quantum key distribution is using entanglement distillation and this monogamy idea. So let's, let's see. Let's combine it. So the idea is that, realistically, how this would work. You have Alice. You have Bob. We have a untrusted quantum channel from one to the other, which if mine intercept, right? So there is now, think about optical fiber. So this is like a quantum channel. And Alice just prepares locally some maximum entangled states, OK, of A, A prime, and send this down the channel, OK? Send this down the channel. And after it sends out the channel, they share a state rho e b. Right? And the channel might be mixed. Eve might intercept the channel, do some quantum operation. So in the end, it will be some general mixed state rho e b. Right? But now, and that's an assumption we can relax. But for simplicity, I will not. Suppose they just send over the channel. And suppose the channel doesn't change from time, over time. Then if they change n times, they have n copies of this entangled state. Right? So they can establish this state just by Alice sending quantum particles to Bob. Right? which is the way we would implement this key distribution protocols. Now, OK, now they have these states. And what is the state of if, including if? Well, it's just some purification of this guy, right? It's just some a n b n e, such that trace of this guy equals the original one, right? But note, like, they don't even know what is the purification, but they have no idea. It can be anything. Um, but it doesn't matter, right? So now suppose they just do the distillation protocol here, right? So suppose they get this guy and using the distillation protocol, right, by LCC, which is now L LOPC, but in what concerns distillation, right? Because they even knows the classical communication as well. They map it to some number of copies of the maximum entangled state, right? So they do that, right? They just need class communication, great. And once they do that, they are done, right? So now they can measure the computational basis. And because this maximum entangled, it must be unknown to if, right? So that's how, you know, that's not how quant the quantum quant quant distribution you, you can think of it, right? So we know that once they have maximum entangled states, right, it's just something, the, the interesting point is that if is completely here in the analysis, right? We do not care what it does. It doesn't even exist to us. All that we have to know is that if A and B certify that they have a maximum entangled state, it must be decoupled from it automatically by quantum mechanics. So they just, using the information from Alice and Bob, not concerning if, they just find a way of mapping the states that can, they, that they can establish two EPR pairs, right? And then they are done, right? So that's the basic idea. Um, and right, monogamy is the core property that allows for that, right? So um, good. Any question? Yeah. And then you do A B measures. Yeah. And then you get that, that state. You didn't get it? How to do it? Uh, and this state you do you get after uh, A B measure you wrote there A B measure the computation. Exactly, yeah. So if you maximum entangled states and you just measure the computational basis, right? You get this state, right? 
because it's clock, of course, but the, the outcomes, they are perfectly correlated, right? So, um, in that way, they can uh, exchange the, the, the secret key is in this way. Exactly, because now they using this. Yeah, that's right. So actually, physically, you have these maximum entangled states. You measure it. You get either 0 or 1, right? So suppose you want to send one secret bit, OK? Then you establish this two qubit maximum entangled state. You measure it. Alice measures it. You get either 0 or 1. She XORs what she, the outcome she got with the message. She sends it to Bob. Bob XOR again with what he measured, right? Because they are perfectly correlated. The XORs will cancel. But because Eve has no idea about if it's 0 or 1, for if it's just a random bit, right? So that's a, yeah. So what you're saying is that the results of the measurements are the keys, right? Exactly, and yeah. that key is only shared by Alice. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. OK. Okay, great. So, um, so it's been a long day, right? Especially for you. Uh, we're tired, and what every physicist does when they are tired, they talk about black holes, right? So, <laughs> let's do it. Right. So, you know, you help me because I'm not an expert in black hole at all. But still, I'm able to explain you this interesting thing about them. So is a, what is a black hole, right? So it's a prediction of ice and theory of, of general relativity, right? Ice and theory of gravity. It says that if you just put enough matter, right, in a small, a small enough region, or you just put enough energy, uh, this will collapse into a black hole, which means it's just a solution of ice equation where stuff can get inside, but it cannot get out, not even light, right? So there is no information that can leak out of the black hole. So there are two important things of a black hole. In the center of the black hole, there is a singularity. And this is a nice thing because it's really something that we think exists, and I'll tell you why we think there is black holes. Uh, but it's something that we think exists where the laws of physics, as we understand, just breaks down, okay? At this point, it's a singularity of, of ice and gravity. Gravity just goes to infinity. We don't have a description for it. Probably we need some theory of gravity to describe it. But maybe say, fine, it's just a point in space time, right? So maybe we can live with it, OK? But let's see that it's not quite like that. Then much, much further away, there is what we call the horizon of the black hole. The horizon of the black hole is just some surface for which um, everything just a little bit inside the horizon cannot, not, cannot leak anymore, OK? So it's irreversible. So some, if a poor like observable Alice is getting inside, if she's here, she can go out. Once she gets inside, she's doomed. She's going towards the singularity, and once towards the singularity, you know, it's like this, how this picture, she becomes like, like a spaghetti, starts to be like squashed up and, you know, die in some tragic way, right? Um, so why we think this exists? Okay, it's a prediction of, of ice and theory of gravity, right? Of general relativity. And we think it's correct, we have many evidence. But I'll say, okay, maybe it's some very peculiar solution that never comes up, right? So indeed, like, I was, it's quite remarkable what is the density you need, right? So, if you want a black hole with the mass of Earth, uh, the, the radius of the Earth would have to be, I think, uh, one millimeter. Okay, so it's a very dense object, right? Uh, but nonetheless, we have evidence that exists. The most striking one is, there's this LIGO, right? Detection of gravitational waves. I think you all heard of it. It was a great achievement for physics, right? And the only explanation that they have is that there's two like spiral black holes which collide in Formula One, and because of all this, right? all this energy that they release, this from these gravitational waves, right? So really we think there are many black holes in the universe and we just detect a, a signal of one, right? Of two actually, very recently. Uh, great, and now we can try to understand this, right? Why, it, um, how these things work. And um, one uh, weird thing about them is that maybe they, how they fit together with the second law of thermodynamics, right? Are they a contradiction to the second law? Because maybe they are entropy dumpster, right? Suppose you have something, some system with a lot of entropy, and we just throw them inside a black hole, okay? Where the entropy went, right? 
because it's gone forever, the system, right? So um, we don't have access to it anymore. So that's a way to decrease the entropy of the universe, at least of the accessible universe. That would be weird, right? So that was something that intrigued people for a while. Uh, but then the answer, the answer now is no. And that's due to Bekenstein. And what he realized is that black holes has entropy, right? So black hole has entropy. Um, and that's just uh, exactly matches out. You know, if, if you send something inside the black hole, just the entropy of the black hole increases just by that amount, right, uh, they got inside. Uh, and moreover, he even had some prediction. So he said that actually it should be something like black hole should have 10 to the power of 69 bits of entropy per square meter, which is, right, astronomical amount and is also a calculation by Bekenstein very interesting. That's the maximum amount of information you can pack in some uh, per, you know, uh, in, a, in a region per unit area of that region, of the surface of that region. In the sense that he showed that if you try to beat this, you automatically form a black hole, right? So uh, you are in the conditions where you form a black hole. So these black holes, they are, you know, the, they have information there, there is entropy there in the most, uh, you know, in, in the most extreme way possible, right? Uh, but now then, okay, this was accepted, but there was a new paradox that emerged from this. And that was something that was upsetting many people, including Stephen Hawking. So, um, So the problem was the following. Um, so okay, great, by, by Bekenstein, black hole has entropy, right? But let's start just applying thermodynamics. If something has entropy, black hole should have some temperature. But if it has temperature, it should radiate, right? But how can it be? Nothing comes out of the black hole, right? So, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, but uh, imagine that, you know, for example, you can engineer to have a black hole where there is this black hole there and outside there is no matter, right? It's just vacuum, right? Then the only, so of course, temperature is zero, very close to zero. And this black hole is very high entropy. So the temperature associated to it will be much higher than the temperature of just vacuum, right? So therefore, in that situation, there should be radiate. Right? You have two, you have two thermodynamical systems with different temperatures that should be, right? radiation from the inside, from one to the other, right? From the hotter one to the other one, right? But then you say, how this, right, gets together with being a black hole, right? With nothing coming out. And, and, and that's what Hawking, to his surprise, found out, right? Um, that indeed there is a radiation, right? And that's what we understand by uh, Hawking radiation. So indeed, the radiates is a quantum mechanical process, right? which is very interesting because it's a macroscopic object, right? It's a huge object, but the only, and because this prediction is in the way, now we have understanding that there is, right? So, um, so let me tell you what is a toy model of this process, right? How at the same time, you know, nothing comes out of them, but still they can radiate. So, So the idea is that we have a black hole, okay? And the black hole, okay, so the singularity is this very, right, uh, weird point, but at the horizon, uh, well, this depends, but black holes, they can be even very small black holes, and they, we do not understand at all, because they, we need quantum gravity to understand. Basically, we don't have quantum gravity. But what we do understand is that, what we know is that this mass of black holes, they can be massive, and they can be so big that at the horizon, Nothing strange happens. The horizon is very smooth. Okay, so we can have a black hole with some smooth horizon. And at this smooth horizon, um, quantum field theory 
is a very good description, and you just use quantum field theory, what they call like curved spacetime, where where is basic quantum field? Yeah, so where we can treat the the metric of spacetime uh, as a classical variable, right? So that's the approximation that is done, and you can do this there. And then, if you do that, a prediction of quantum mechanics is that the vacuum actually is this very unstable thing, right? There is quantum fluctuations. So all over the vacuum, all the time, there is a pair creation. There is like a particle in some pure entangled states where one has positive energy, the other has negative energy, but they just annihilate again, right? So the vacuum, there is all these quantum fluctuations happening all the time. And, and so this, and these quantum fluctuations, you can describe them as like you have a vacuum, and then there's some process, some unitary process, which map it like to two particles, uh, which will be in a state like that. So, so these, you know, these are some states of the particle in the anti uh, the particle with positive energy and the particle with negative energy. This is just some distribution of energies which come from, um, from the uh, stress tensor energy, right, uh, metric there. And this is the temperature which you, uh, will be the, the temperature of, um, okay, at the vacuum, this would be like really zero temperature, but maybe it's not vacuum, right? Maybe it's just some uh, equilibrium state of very low energy, right? And then there'll be some temperature, like for example, if it's close to a black hole. Um, but now, so what is happening? Vacuum, right, you can think, this is very pictorial, but you can do this precise, but that's the picture we take here. You form this pair and it disappears, right? So you form this pair, it disappears. This is happening all the time, like all this complicated process. But let's do, look at what happens at the black hole. And let's suppose just the EPI, you know, this is like a pure entangled state. Suppose the temperature is sufficiently low, which is, so this is very well approximated by just a maximum entangled state, right? At some dimension, the dimension depends on the cutoff on energy that you're doing, right? But let's just abstract away, suppose it's finite dimension. Then if you're very close to the horizon, suppose this pair sometimes is formed, where one is just inside the horizon, the other is outside the horizon. Then the picture is that this particle of negative energy cannot leak out, right? It's inside a black hole, so it's forever there. And this is outside. But then you, if you take the partial trace of this, right? So, what do we get? We get thermal, right? We get a thermal uh, state. And that's the calculation that Hawking did much more precise than this, but that's the basic idea, you know? Because of quantum field theory, which can be applied at the horizon of the black hole, you find by these quantum fluctuations that um, outside there is a radiation, right? There is a radiation, and you can think of that as actually some local entangled states of, of, of some fluctuation, some, some uh, virtual particle of positive energy with some of negative energy just inside the black hole, right? So there's this local process for which the black hole is radiant. Um, okay, so. Fine, that's a prediction. Unfortunately, it's very, very hard to detect this with Hawking radiation, right? So it's tiny bits of energy. I don't have the numbers, I should have written them down, but it's not something that we can do experiments, but it's, um, yeah, it's like a thought experiment, but it's something that we believe, you know, and, and it explains things. So it's a consistent view. But now, Now, you know, it's a sequence of like people come, it's really like a, a flow the following way. Uh, it's a great source of, of, uh, of mysteries about physics, black holes, right? And we are still not at the final answer. So people try to understand it, comes up with something which is weird. For example, whether it, it's, whether it violates the second law of thermodynamics, someone comes with a solution which apparently solves the issue, but this leads to a new issue, right? Which they don't know how to solve, and then they find, and so on. And let's follow this flow to the current one. Unfortunately, there will be a, a final issue that we don't know how to solve yet, right? But uh, I'll tell you the state of the art in terms of what we don't understand about black holes. Uh, so, great. Now suppose, let's suppose that we are God. So we know the Hamiltonian of the universe, right? So, and then how it works? What is the formation of a black hole? We have a bunch of matter described by the quantum state Psi. Let's assume it's pure. This just collapses into a black hole. Well, actually, I don't have to write this. Right, so this is like inside a black hole. I, we just write in this quantum state, we just put them sufficiently close that they form the black hole. Um, okay, but now let's just wait and what will happen? 
actually, once the radiation comes out, there is entropy leaking out, and indeed, the entropy of the black hole gets diminished, right? And that makes sense in this view because this particle which is inside has negative energy, right? So, the, you know, it's really everything in this picture makes sense, but the, the uh, black hole evaporates, it radiates away, and it gets smaller, 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 and eventually disappears, okay? It's a very long time scale, but it does. But, you know, we like quantum mechanics, right? So we want the process of forming the black hole and seeing the radiation to be unitary, right? So, um, and now we have a conundrum, right? Because what is the process? We put Psi, right, into the black hole. And what we get in the end is a bunch of Hawking radiation, right? Which is this mixed state, which is completely independent of Psi, right? This all depends on temperature, right? So and this temperature depends on the current entropy of the black hole, right? So it changes slowly over time, but it's, right, something completely independent of, of Psi. So we end up in some mixed states, right? Um, and that's weird, right? So does this mean black hole bre breaks unitarity? Right, so, so now what is worse, to evaluate the second law of thermodynamics or quantum mechanics, right? So probably quantum mechanics, right? So <laughs> the thermodynamics is very robust, but it's, uh, no, but that's, you know, then people start getting, you start a, a debate, it was a famous debate, right? So for Hawking, for the black hole was indeed breaking unitarity, some other people, maybe like Kip Thorn and, and John Presque thought that no unitarity had to be preserved in some way, and people didn't know how to do that, how to answer that. Eventually, the idea um, that, and, and, and then you know, you can, um, um, let me see, yeah, so eventually one idea that emerged was of black hole. Um, well, but actually before that, let me tell you a little bit something more. Um, okay, so what, what will be the... Um, so, so this row is the state of what? Of the radiation. Yeah. So wh what is the weight of um, of um, of this not being the case? The weight of this not being the case would be that actually, in the end, this row actually is equal to psi, right? Um, so maybe you know, indeed there is a yes. Because with a unitary matrix, you cannot go from pure to a mixed state, right? No, because the whole is the whole process. Like you start from a pure state, you form the black hole, you wait until it completely evaporates, and then you collect all matter again, right? So there is nothing else like we, yeah, right? But in, indeed, so, you know, if this, so how did we get this premise that breaks unitarity if we assume that this Hawking radiation is completely independent of, of Psi, right? Which appears to be, right? So at least in this, this here, using this local quantum field theory, this has nothing to do with Psi. Then other proponents of unitarity they say, no, actually, row in the end will be indeed psi again. It's just that, right, it's more subtle what happens. Um, and, but then you say, well, we are, right, so with this Hawking radiation, how can we get the total state back in the end? And the answer is that you, um, you can, actually, in a way. But there will be other problems coming. But let, let me tell you this idea. This idea is, and that's... Uh, maybe page toy model for black holes. So the black hole has some dynamics, right, going on, which, you know, is the dynamics given by quantum gravity and whatever else we need, but it's very complicated. But we think it's very it's crampy. It's like some chaotic quantum system. And then a good description of, of this is just to say that this quantum state, which from the black hole, actually has similar properties to just a generic quantum state. M namely, a quantum state taken at random, right? Which is like, you know, a quantum state on n qubits is just a point on you know, a two, 2 to the n dimensional space. Uh, and we can just take these points at random on this space. And then we can analyze the properties and we see that this has some generic properties, right? So, um, psi, n, let me do a little bit of detour. So, psi n qubits, um, that's, The same as a point on a 2 to the n, or maybe if you want a real 4 to the n um, dimensional sphere, right? Radius 1, right? 
at this sphere, we can just take points at random there, right? Okay, so uh, now I'm getting to more details, but let me just tell you what I want to achieve here. I just want to show that this view, at least for now, only this conodrum that we go from side to row, and the fact that this local ro Hawking radiation appears to be in some maximally mixed states, right? Because the temperature is so low, that's not incompatible, okay? There could be a process where psi gets mapped to psi in the end, and locally, it looks just like thermonoid, just like max limits. And that's a generic property of quantum states. Um, so, right, so the picture is, you have this dimension. Uh, this is a quantum state, right? And then we can just choose, is a sphere, we can choose random points on this sphere, right? And this uniform measure on the sphere is called Ha measure. So it's just the uniform measure on, on pure quantum states, right? Which is very, has this very nice geomet uh, geometric interpretation because quantum states is just points on this hypersphere. And now just, let's just look at properties of this random state. So suppose psi, we take at random from our measure. Of course, the state that we actually have in the black hole psi is not like that, but that is the assumption of quantum chaos we're going to take which seems reasonable, which is because this dynamics there is very complicated and scrambling and chaotic, you have similar properties to this random state. Then a property that you can show, um, unfortunately I don't have time to show, but it's, it's, it's not a hard calculation. Maybe next time actually I'll, I'll see if I can show this to you uh, because it's used for something else you're going to do. Um, with high probability, you can show the following. You can show that, suppose you split this in two subsystems the way you want, okay? just two partitions of the qubits, of the n qubits. And you look at, you trace out B, and you compare with the maximum mixed states of, right, this is the dimension of A. Then you can show that this is smaller than something like um, uh, two, no, not two, actually, yeah, maybe two. I'll check this next time, but it's two times dA over dB Let's denote the dimension like this. Okay, so we have A and B. Um, dimension, right? So the total dimension 2 to the n equals dA times dB. So it means that every subsystem of size less than the less than half the total number of qubits, it just looks like maximally mixed. Okay? So meaning that every sub less than half with the rest, right? And that's very interesting, but it doesn't matter how it's true. So that, will exp that would explain it, right? So indeed, the, uh, some accepted view of black hole is that it is a unitary process. You start putting this quantum matter in, and then this quantum matter just, well, what I haven't told you, but I should have, because it's useful. I, I, I told you actually, right, that Bekenstein, no, I didn't. It produced a formula for the entropy of the black hole and it goes as is proportional to the area of the black hole, right? So the, the view will be that you have this matter in, and then this matter gets very like delocalized on the boundary, okay? There, and they start just writing it back in some, right, so in some um, whatever way. But indeed, even though each of the qubits you see, it's in a maximum entangled state, compatible with this view of rocking radiation, there is this subtle global correlations there, and once you collect all the qubits, you can back, you get back in deep psi, right? And if it's a ra if, if the state there has similar properties to a hard random state, exactly the case, okay? So that's good. Um, the idea is that if we were able to reconstruct the state of all the, the yeah. pairs that come out, then we yeah. would actually be able to see the pure state. Exactly, yeah, that will, okay, good. But now let's see, and this, Again, right, another problem now if you take this view, right, so. Before you raise that, so here it seems to be very important that the particle that goes in has negative energy, and the particle that goes out has positive energy, right? right? Yeah. For this, uh, but actually, when you have pair creation. Yeah, I, I, don't know, I don't know the answer of this question, yeah. But it, it's because this is a very simplest toy model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do a better quantum field theory calculation and it, it, they get the right thing. But I, I thought the same thing, but I have, yeah. I cannot answer, sorry. I, well, because we assume it is, it doesn't have to be, but yeah, we choose to form the black hole from yeah, pure okay, states. But uh, 
When matter is created and the negative uh, energy particle enters the black hole, the entropy uh, diminishes, right? The entropy they hope, they hope gets so smaller, yeah. if it was in a pure state, the entropy was already zero, and now it starts to be negative. So the... Um, no, so that, uh, right, it's a good question, but that just shows that we have to be very careful. So um, I'm not saying that the entropy of the black hole is the entropy of this pure state. So there is something, there's a description about the black hole physics that we do not understand, right? Um, but now what I'm saying is just from the outside observer, suppose there is an outside observer. Can it describe the whole thing as a unitary, right? And I'm saying there is a view where you can. So this matter comes in, it forms the black hole. This black hole by Bekenstein has some entropy, but this Bekenstein calculation uses uh, Einstein general theory of relativity, right? So we do not know how to match it with quantum mechanics. So we don't even try that. But for the outside observer, it would make sense, right? The matter comes in, inside the black hole, we don't know what happens. It starts leaking out this Hawking radiation. And in the end, all the qubits will be again in the pure states, right? So there is a scattering matrix, a unitary matrix, which describes the formation of the black hole and, and the radiation from an outside perspective, right? Okay? Um, and, and indeed, there will be another description inside the black hole, which actually people try to figure out what it will be, but I haven't told you, right? So, but it's a good point. Yeah, it's not the, the entropy of the black hole is from this pure state. Um, right, so, well, my time is almost up, right? So, I'll have to continue this next time. So, and maybe here's a good time to stop. But basically, what I, what I want to show you, uh, what I will tell you in the beginning of next class, is that thinking more carefully about this, I will come up with a thought experiment where if we assume this, where I told you, this view of rocking radiation from effective quantum field theory, if I, I insist that the black hole has to be unitary the process, which we want, uh, then there is a violation of monogamy of entanglement. Okay, so um, there is something we want to understand here. Or, or the firewall, white firewall, or the horizon, which appear to be very smooth, there must be a huge wall of energy, a firewall, which just burns everything instantaneously that leaks in. Okay, which is also kind of outrageous, but we'll get there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, any question or maybe it's too much for today? So tomorrow is the normal time. Both lessons are in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. É, é bom que eu tenho que aprender também, né? Porque, é. Posso falar português? Claro. Então, é, ali no começo começou a discussão que a questão da temperatura e tudo mais. Certo.